Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the panel on delivering on the promise of personalized learning. And um, we're going to be having this panel discussion for about the next uh, 50 minutes. And what I wanted to do, we have a, uh, just a quick uh, last minute uh, uh, substitution in terms of one of our panelists. So I want to just quickly introduce the people that we have. I want to set it up uh, and then start the discussion. Very pleased to have this group of folks here. Uh, starting on my right is Eric Schneider. He's the Assistant Superintendent of Instruction and highly uh, from the highly innovative Minnetonka Public Schools. Uh, we have Elon Samuha, who is the co-CEO of Transcend Education and the architect of the Greenfield Project at Achievement First. And then we have Stu Udell, who is the, now the uh, recently appointed Chief Executive Officer of K-12. Uh, and instead of Helene Jones, uh, we have Brad Bernatek, Brad Bernatek from the Gates Foundation. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we want to start off by really talking about personalized learning. It's obviously a vast topic. Uh, and so what we're going to try to do is to have a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. And for those of you who know the Harvard Business School case study method, our approach is to have these panelists do 90% of the talking. Uh, I want to try to ask <laughs> some of the provocative questions. If I take a position, it may not represent my own position, so don't take it personally. Uh, but we're going to try to explore the edges of where we are uh, so that we don't end up spending the next 50 minutes with everybody shaking their head and agreeing on, on, on a vast topic like this. And we're going to try to cover uh, a lot of ground, as much ground as possible. So I thought uh, the one way to start this off is when you think about technology and innovations in education, personalized learning is clearly one of the promises, the benefits, really where the imagination goes. How can we actually use technology as a way to ensure that students are engaged, uh, that we are learning at the right pace, our, the instructional program, the curriculum, everything is actually directed in a way that fits the uniqueness of every student out there. Yet, I think if I look around the room, the question of how well are we doing is a very open question. And we've been at this for some time. So I've asked the panelists to think before, uh, to pick a number between 1 and 10. How well are we delivering on this promise? Now, I don't know what they're going to say. I told them, don't all pick five. That's what I, that was the only <laughs> instruction I gave them. So can't pick five. Uh, but Eric, why don't we start with you? You're, you're the person who's representing the school district yes. today. So why don't we start? How well are we delivering on this promise? You know, I, uh, I'm going to give us a three, which is going to be disappointing, I think, for some people. But, it, but you know, I think what's, what's, what's driven public education um, has, has largely in the last 30 years been standardized testing. and. And, uh, and that really has, I think, uh, limited the uh, potential for us to, to really deliver on that promise, right? The, the whole idea of student-centered learning is not a new concept. Um, you know, there's some great drivers right now in, in the tech industry that are, that are gonna create opportunities, but um, teachers have been trying to, you know, reflect the interests of their kids for a long time. We just are in working within some sort of relatively new constraints with the uh, shift towards standardized testing. Okay, so you picked the three. And uh, since HBS is also known for something called a cold call, for those of you who don't know, you know, you have a classroom, you cold call someone. I'm going to go off script, and I'm going to point to Stu. Because, Stuart, I went to the K-12 presentation this morning where I heard a great presentation about how well you guys are doing on personalized learning. <laughs> Eric says three. What do you say? Well, look, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm not a glass half full guy. I'm a glass overflowing guy generally. So I will say, I will say eight. I thought um, you were going to say eleven, and, by and, the way. You know, it's a matter. It's a matter <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would be overflowing. Uh, you know, it's a matter of where your baseline is. So if the baseline is 30 years ago, call it 1985 or so, we didn't have adaptivity. We didn't have gamification. We, you know, we didn't have all these tools that allow us to do some of the great things that we're doing today. But Certainly, when you look around the conference here and see the potential 
of what's there. There's, there's a long way to go, certainly. We, you know, again, we didn't, we didn't have MOOCs. We didn't have competency-based. So, so these are things that I think are uh, real enablers moving forward to really personalize instruction at a different level. It's obviously something that we're all doing part of, I think, reasonably well today on a relative basis with, uh, with a lot of room for uh, improvement. Elon, so you're figuratively and literally That's in between, right. yeah. but where, what's your number? <clears throat> I'm actually going to agree with both of them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, sounds like a five to me. That would be a five. <laughs> 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 five point five. five, 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 five. five. Okay. Um, but let me let me say my first instinct is a three, okay. um, and uh, I think we actually are at a three. I think we have the potential to be at an eight. I just don't think we're realizing that potential. Um, and uh, and the reason why is that personalized learning is not just a um, concept that we can shove into the traditional model of schooling. Uh, and it might be that the reason why Stu thinks it's Nate is because that's not what they're doing. Right? They're actually like, they've got a way of doing it outside of the traditional model of schooling to actually realize the potential of it. Um, but so many of the personalized learning efforts that we're doing, uh, to me, fall into one of two categories. One, basically just digitizing the traditional model, um, which is not actually going to move us forward. It might make things moderately more efficient, maybe slightly more engaging, uh, but it doesn't unlock the potential of personalized learning where, to me, we've unlocked the potential of personalized learning when students are wildly motivated to learn, right? Not just for every 30 hours of effort they put in, they get 15% better results, but they are wildly motivated to learn because it's at their level, it's what they want to work on, it's at, you know, in the place and time that they want to do it. Um, and I, you know, so one is we either we, we digitize the model. The second is that we try these new, very promising ways of doing things within a model that is, hasn't changed in any other way. Um, so teachers still have the exact same mindsets, uh, they say the same exact workload. They still get paid the exact same amount of money. Um, the furniture and fixtures of every classroom are exactly the same. Parents have the same exact role in the building, um, which is to say very little of a role. Um, uh, uh, you know, we've siloed everything by subjects. There's math, there's English. Um, and, and so our perspective is unless we gut the entire thing, uh, we're, not, we're never going to realize the, the, the promise of personalization because the promise of personalization requires us to change the fundamentals of how we do school. So Brad, I want to get you in the conversation. And the one word that Elon said that kind of caught my, eye, eye, uh, my ear, not my eye, was we have a gut the system. And you guys are in the pro business of funding and supporting a lot of organizations that are trying to personalize learning, mm -hmm. increase you know, engagement in just the way that uh, we're talking about. Is that what you're really trying to do, is try to essentially transform the entire system? Or do you believe that Gates, could go, Gates Foundation and all the other folks that are supporting this effort can do uh, an add-on effort to deliver on this promise? Well, maybe I'll try to split the difference and say, I mean, I think transforming from within. Because, I mean, the reality is, I mean, that our, when, when this strategy started, and I would say, I, I would put myself at about a five or a six. I'd probably put, say, a six, if you'd ask me. Is yeah. that when we started this work several years ago, we, we very much had a focus exclusively on kind of whole school, whole school model redesign. And we've created, helped create, you know, maybe 150 schools, 200 schools nationwide that are doing tremendous things. And I mean, tr promising practices. But I think over time, as we think about how do you bring this to scale, the reality is if you're going to bring this to thousands of schools across the country, you need to think about the systems that, that they live in. Mm -hmm. And so our, I, would say our, I would say we still think about whole school model redesign, but we also think about how do you transform within the existing system. So we invest in a set of school districts set of school districts, for example, that are thinking about how they incubate new schools within their system. So I think it's, it's not an either or, and the notion of gutting the system is, I mean, that's a pretty lofty goal. And when you think about sort of large scale system change, um, it, that's, that's hard to do. Yeah. Eric, it's striking. You had the lowest number, uh, and you're in the school system. So what's your, what's your response to these guys? <laughs> well, I do, I feel awful about that. <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, but, but you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think Elon said it, you know, the reality is we're, we're here. The potential exists 
to be you know, farther to the right uh, on, on that spectrum. And, and I think um, you know, when you're at this event, you're part of that group that believes that we're going to get there. And, and the schools and educators who are here um, are believers. So I think the, the reality, however, is that you know, we are a slow moving system. And we're not agile. And, um, and the reality is that um, you know, a lot of classrooms are the way you know, Brad described. I mean, you've got, you got very traditional environments. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the basic question, though, is if, what exists in the, in the school districts, you know, the 13,500 school districts, that's not going to change overnight. Right. Uh, and the idea is that technology would actually help us to accelerate that, to change that. I mean, to a little bit of Brad's point, it's not just about one or the other, but it's really about accelerating that change and using technology to overcome some of the barriers uh, to doing that. See, like I would say, each, each of these three are doing something different to, to provide that kind of thought leadership, right? Like, how, how do you redesign a school, gut, gut a school system or school model? Um, model. That's, that's one approach that we can look at. You know, tools like K-12, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a product we can purchase as a school district, right? Or, 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 or the Gates approach to finding these um, innovative schools and districts and showing you know, an example of how it can be done. You know, I've worked with the Gates uh, funded grant before, and um, you know, that's a, those are great models for folks to look at. And educators are looking for those models. Well, I, I, can I just add? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, please, I think go on. The reality is, too, is that, I mean, you're talking about technology, and it's like, I mean, fundamentally, this is about an instructional strategy, instructional models that are technology enabled. I mean, I think what's, what's, what has me excited on the one hand is, is that we've seen personalization in nearly every facet of our life. Um, save education. Although, as Eric pointed out, you know, teachers have been talking about differentiating instruction for a very long time, and that's been the goal. The challenge is they haven't, seen the, they haven't found the structures by which to do it at scale and to do it sort of systematically. And so I think we, we see an opportunity to kind of take that promise and, quite frankly, a lot of enthusiasm in the space and leverage technology in a way to make that differentiation possible in a way that it wasn't historically. Yeah, yeah we, we think about personalizing at three levels. We think about it at the technology platform level, and certainly K-12 is investing a lot of, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, in uh, improving our platform so that it can be truly adaptive so that we have the opportunity to, you know, provide different types of supports for different kids. Uh, secondly, we think about the curriculum and the assessment that, that sits on top of that platform as a way to personalize and kind of embedding all the new tools to do that better, like avatars and, and, and like gamification. And then thirdly, we think about it from an instructional perspective, which is exactly what Brad just spoke about, is how do you take that technology that's more personalized, how do you take that curriculum that's more personalized and make it come alive in the classroom, whether it's a virtual classroom or a brick and mortar public school or, or a blended model of some type. It seems that we're talking about almost at a very different level here. One is you're, we're talking about classroom practices and how we can personalize that. Elon, you seem to be talking really at a system level and saying basically, I mean, that may be fine, but really to get, to get the full benefits of personalized learning, you have to do it at the, at the organizational level or at the a school much more school-wide level. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Yeah. I mean, so, so what, I'll talk for a minute about how I got to the place where I'm at this conference, <laughs> um, which is uh, when I worked for Teach for America, running training for uh, core members, I got the opportunity to see thousands of classrooms across the country, um, which is such a gift. I mean, I feel so blessed that I got to do that. And without fail, in every single classroom, there's only one thing that was true in every classroom, which was the teacher was always the hardest working person in the room. Um, and, uh, and when I saw that, I realized, wait, it's, if it's the kids who are supposed to be doing the learning, why is the teacher working harder? And so the reason why we feel so passionately about whole school model transformation, that also leads to system transformation. We're not, we are not thinking about that as much. We probably should. Um, but it, is, is that unless that fundamentally changes, right? unless we can have a design of school that does not require one person to be in front of 30 kids with a chalkboard in the same way they were in 1850, um, just adding some computers in the back of the room or giving every kid an iPad or et cetera, right. is actually not going to change the reality. Right. Um, and uh, like there's a complete reorientation for the staff, 
for parents and also for students. I mean, what's interesting, what we found yeah. is with all of our um, dreaming and design, uh, you know, the model that we're working on in Greenfield, which you reference in, in, in New Haven, um, we didn't think hard enough about the students themselves and the transformation they needed to have, yeah. right? They, you know, we'd had fifth graders who every day for their whole school lives have been told what to do. Uh, and just opening the door to personalization right. didn't suddenly make them intrinsically motivated. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so there, I mean, there's some deep work to do. Like we're talking about true transformation uh, that is going to, that sure, certainly is technology enabled, that helps. Um, but I don't think we achieve this until we yeah. stop using the word blended, right? Like it's like okay. we don't blend work. We use computers every day, right? Yeah. Uh, so why don't we? Why did I say that I blended work when I sent an email today? Uh, because it is so <laughs> part of the fabric, right, of what we do. Uh, because we have the mindset that's like it's productivity. We've got to get stuff done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just don't think we've had that awakening yet uh, in a way that could help us realize the potential. Eric, what do you think? Well, you know, um, Elon said something towards the beginning. We won't be there until kids are passionate about their learning, right? I mean, and we don't see that. You know, we see that in kindergarten, but then slowly they lose that excitement, right? And, and it's, it's, it's a sad phenomenon. And, and you know, when, when we talk about personalized learning, what we're talking about is really injecting voice and choice into the learning for kids, right? right? Where, where they, and, and if you can, you disrupt time and space, right? And, and you know, if, if, you can, if you can bake that into your environment, you're starting to personalize learning, right? And, and I think, you know, to, to Elon's point, you know, kids, and, and this is, I think, especially true of kids today, but I think it's always been true, is when, is when kids have a voice in their learning, they're engaged and they own it. Okay, but to be fair to Stu and K-12, you know, they're not, they're not blending, at least in the, the one side of your business. It was all basically uh, online or virtual. Is, what do you say to Elon's point about the students? I, don't, I doubt the students that are on your the K-12, not the fuel ed side, but on the, they don't feel that they're blending anything, that this is the way they do things. And are you seeing that they're truly engaged? And are you seeing the kind of, uh, the reactions and interactions that we're talking about now? Sure. I mean, I think the engagement happens in lots of different ways. Uh, Elon talked about family engagement earlier. I think by definition, you know, I think the choice movement typically has a very engaged type of family member and parent involved. So that's, that's different, I think, from the start, from the setup. And then, um, you know, notwithstanding Elon's comments about blended, which I think were appropriate, we do have uh, not just purely virtual implementations, but I, I visited one of our uh, kind of brick and mortar facilities that we blend uh, in uh, in Nevada uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we have the the only um, uh, team in the state uh, in the state of Nevada that qualified for the National Robotics Championship. So, you know, that happens with <laughs> self-directed learners who are doing certain types of work one way. They're demanding resources from teachers in a different type of way. We push teacher resources and we kind of pull teacher resources depending on their level of need. And then they get to do Lego and robotics and have different types of activities in a different way, whether it's a blended model or not. So I, I think there's just a lot of uh, kind of ways to do engagement. And it may be different for you know, every kid. I just want to maybe shift gears a little bit. Uh, and maybe uh, also say something provocative because we want, we want to have something interesting. What if you woke up one day and found out that not every student wants, learns best in a personalized environment in the way you talk about? I mean, there's this fundamental assumption that we have to do it that way. No? Yes? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, is it good I, yeah. for everybody or is it just a few? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, so I think that personalization uh, taken to the extreme doesn't pass the sniff test, right? So personalization to the extreme would be the Matrix, basically, right? <laughs> the, um, movie. Uh, the movie. <laughs> the movie. The Matrix, right? Exactly. Um, and uh, and and that that's not what we want, right? That's like if we think about from an outcomes level, what do we want as parents, as educators, as members of society for all students? We would not say that just highly efficient learning that is exactly at their level at the right time. Like that is not what we want. Um, nor is it the way, to your point, that all kids learn best. Right. Uh, in fact, right, like there's plenty of research that shows that to build word and world knowledge for students who have a 40 million word gap, as, as our low income students do, um, the thing they need to do more than anything is talk, right? right. And they need to talk about the same subject, with, which means everyone needs to be saying the same thing at that particular moment, um, a lot, and get immersed, et cetera. And so I think the real, th this is why we see it as a bigger design challenge than just 
too right. personalized. But how to take these elements of personalization, which are very powerful, and by the way, were around even before we had technology, um, like Montessori, yeah. for example, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and and you know use the power of technology certainly, but also think about all of the outcomes we really care about, um, and that gets to a design of school that includes personalization, but does not rest only on it. Brad, how, where does the, the foundation, Gates Foundation, stand on this kind of spectrum of I, ideas around personalization? Is it good for everybody? Are you, is this something that you're dogmatic well, about? Is, well, you know, like, again, I mean, I think I'd be like, well, I mean, I think I'd be like Elon. It's like, I think one of the challenges right now is that people, you know, personalization has been synonymous, become synonymous with individualization. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and that's just not the case. And so, like, I mean, um, I mean, for those, I don't know, he might be in the room, Todd Rose talking about the end of average and sort yeah. of like contextualization. It's like context is king. And so how personalization plays out for a student, different kinds of students is going to vary dramatically based upon their socioeconomic background, based on their personality, et cetera. So, I mean, personalization is going to play itself off di differently. And that doesn't mean it's, that doesn't mean individualization that kids are working on their own. There's an you know, so I mean, in the best schools I think we see, there's an important social component of kids learning together and learning yeah. from one another. So, um, I, again, I, I think it's just it's it will play out differently in different places for different types of kids. Okay. Stu, anything you want to add to this? On this side? Um, not on this thread. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I well, can talk. I can fill the space. No, no, no. We don't need to fill the space. So why don't we uh, switch gears a little bit. One of the things that, Eric, you, you started off talking about was around assessment. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about personalization, individualization, and any type of contextualization, I think it goes down to also understanding right. using better formative assessments as a, as a tool to create a better feedback mechanism so that whatever technology or systems that you're using can then be serving the students better. Talk to us a little bit about what you see out there in terms of your assessment, what's lacking, what needs to change, and how that may affect what the folks on your right are, right. are doing. So um, you know, when I think about assessment and, and the pivot that, that I think is best serving this conversation around personalized learning is, is a shift towards performance-based assessment. You know, because it's, that's, just, that's unstandardizable in, you know, in, at its core, right? I mean, if, if students are, are you know, um, trying to perform their their evidence of learning, right? It's a it's going to have it's going to be genuine. It's going to be unique. Um, so that's something that we were, we're working on. We we have a, a test that we're running right now in our district around something called integrated performance assessment, where the performance is actually baked into the learning. So you're never sitting for an assessment. I mean, it's happening while you're, you know, coming to class every day, and the teacher is trained in a, a, you know with a, a rubric based. Uh, measure about how to watch for the you know the look for us right and and then you know the kid doesn't even sit a test they never know that you know that they that they were just assessed it's happening ongoing so that's you know that's for me a, kind of a, a perfect world if we could bake that performance and integration into the into the lear learning environment would be would be pretty cool is that something that any of you are doing now or supporting yeah, well, we're certainly thinking about uh, a lot about uh, student-centered accountability, generally speaking. What we do, you know, we tend to get a lot of kids who come into our system in the middle of the school year, maybe several grade <laughs> levels behind. Uh, we may have them, in some cases, for a short period of time. So, you know, typical proficiency measures just don't really work. We have to really think about, um, about uh, uh, value-added growth and performance certainly you know ties into that. So we're we're uh, we're certainly doing kind of basic blocking and tackling, embedding even more formative assessment in our product every day. Lots of pulse checks to just kind of get a sense as to where kids are because we don't always know exactly what their timeline is going to be. I mean, I mean the reality is, I mean a lot of if you're in a public school, you are very much driven by the state level test, and we're going to be talking about more about. I mean, there's going to be more and more. Differentiation by state, given the new uh, legislation, and so I mean, I think this sounds good, right? Uh, but is that really the reality of what you know the folks out to your right are going to be supporting or creating for you? Well, it's I mean, and, and what I'm talking about is a bit of a luxury because you can't make that pivot unless you're confident that you're going to get the standardized results, right? right. You, you know, you're so you have to, you know, you have to. It's a both hand, right? And and I think from our perspective, um, you know, we're we're fortunate because we are getting those metrics 
in the standardized environment. So we, we have that luxury. Would you have gotten it anyway? I mean, given where Minnetonka is? And that's a, it's a valid point. I mean, you know, when, you, when you're serving a community that's high achieving, mm -hmm. um, you know, the expectations are just different, right? I mean, you're, we're still under a, a significant pressure from our, you know, from our community. It's just a different kind of pressure versus you know, schools or districts where they're not meeting those metrics. So. Yeah. Elon, you worked in Hartford, is that right? Or? Or New Haven. New yeah. Haven. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's a very different community than Minnetonka, yeah. obviously. Definitely. So. Yeah, and I visited Minnetonka. That's awesome what Eric and, and team are doing. I mean, the, uh, my take on this is that, so there's a lot of, I, you know, uh, on Facebook, I have friends that where we basically agree on everything except education. Um, and, uh, and so when, like, I see, like, the opt-out, whatever, like, I, I, I've actually had conversations, including with my sister, um, where I said, let's go to the Common Core website, look at the standards, and find me the standard that you don't care that your daughter will know. And when you, know, when you point that out, then go ahead and opt out. Um, but so the reason I say that is that the, the standards themselves, I think, are healthy constraints. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I think it's fine for us to say, especially <coughs> with new and improved standards, with NGSS, et cetera, to say one of the constraints of the models we design is that kids, even in inauthentic ways, can walk into that test and kill it. <laughs> like, that's fine. Uh, that, doesn't, that, that actually frees us to do a lot of, like, yeah. a lot of things that will make that true, uh, including more authentic assessments, et cetera. Um, it just, it's, and so I guess I would say it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, if that's the end, if that is all people are being held accountable for, and that's all we're caring about, then we just have an incomplete view of what it's going to take to be successful. Um, but the idea that these standards, some like it is our, we're, we are by choice limiting our and narrowing our scope only to that in very boring kind of sequential ways that don't really match the way kids learn or are motivated. Um, there are tons of possibilities if we hold ourselves to those high standards to make that a constraint and a goal that we're going for as part of a broader set of goals that we're going for. I mean, I think, I mean, I think Elon said it well. I think it's necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, this, the, the Common Core standards are set a high bar for performance, and I think that's, that's important. And I think you see the consortium assessments, for example, that the recent Fordham and Hummer report showed that they, you know, were, were pretty well aligned with the Common Core, which is a huge step forward. Um, I actually have a body of work called the Assessment for Learning Project that is sort of mm -hmm. looking at yeah. broader, broader notions of assessment. Again, it's necessary but not sufficient. I think that grade level, you know, being able to achieve grade level rigor at a point in time is important, but it's necessary but not sufficient. And I think that actually I'll pivot and sort of say, I think one of the things we worry a bit about is that you see out in the field a lot of classrooms that say they're kind of doing personalized learning. And when you, when you look for the rigor, you're not seeing it. And I think the danger is, is that um, the, the reality is, is that um, if you haven't calibrated for what grade level rigor looks like, the notion that you're going to create a framework where kids can, you can dial it up or dial it down based on the needs of the student, if you haven't calibrated grade level rigor first, you know, you're, 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 you're not going to be providing the rigor they need, whether it's developmentally appropriate or not. So I think that's an important point. Yeah, look, I mean, I think if we focus only on personalization as defined by interest level, we could let a kid read 12 books in a row on horses because that's what they like, but it doesn't necessarily create growth. So I do think it's a layering in or a matrixing of both kind of the high standards. And, you know, look, I, uh, I'm going back and forth for Virginia in the short run. I live in Long Island. Last week, Long Island wide, which I'll remind people is larger in population than 20 states in this country, we had 53% math opt-outs Long <coughs> Island wide and 51% ELA opt-outs. So, you know, that's a real problem. Now, we, you know, certainly at K-12, we, we tend to be at kind of 95% and higher because we, we, uh, we, we have a different system to operate in. But I think, you know, we can't lose sight of the high water benchmarks that we, you know, a lot of smart people agreed are, are smart benchmarks. Right. And then looking at kind of a learning as a progression at the same time. And that's what we're working hard on trying to figure out, but there's not easy answers. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing. Where we messed up, I think, is that we raised the bar for everybody to these more rigorous standards and then said, and within the same model you've always been running. Yeah. Hit these. Yeah. 
right? right? Um, and we, you can't do it, right? You can't just keep doing the same thing and then say, we're just going to hit a higher bar. And then sometimes you can wrap it in personalization. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, it's gonna be a and then, and then you're, we're just personalizing so, for you, then, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so it, I mean, interestingly, the part of the reason Achievement First even started doing the screen field work is they, you know, they took the Common Core assessments earlier than everyone, uh, and they got their butts kicked. Uh, and, and you know, they yeah. like they had like eighty percent proficiency in math. It's like it's thirty percent now. Whoops. Whoops. Right. right. Uh, and wait a minute, we can't actually work harder than we're working right now. So something has to change about the fundamentals. Uh, yeah. And so yeah, I just want to kind of put out there that like we still have the second shoe hasn't dropped yet. You know, it's like we raise the standards, we can actually change the way we do things. Like the standards, don't like the test, yeah. right? That's right. basically right. Well, Eric. Well, and, and and if you know anything about the Midwest, you know, you'll know how hard it is for me to say this because I'm from Minnesota, and I'm actually going to um, shout out a little bit to Wisconsin. I don't know if there's any Wisconsin <laughs> people here, but it's very, very hard to do. I'm going to choke on this a little bit. Um, uh, Fred Newman is a professor from University of Wisconsin Madison who's done some fantastic work in what you're talking about, Brad. That that you're, you're making sure the rigor is baked in to that authentic you know, experience that the kids are having. And that's, um, that his work has, uh, has led to a group called Authentic uh, Intellectual Work, which has done a ton of work in Iowa. So again, I'm, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> but uh, but so we, we, like, that's a group we watch, because they're doing exactly what you're talking about. They're taking sort of that authentic kind of experience that we want kids to have and, and making sure that the rigor exists. And um, you know, authentic intellectual work kind of speaks for itself. But it's, it's, very, it's a very structured approach to, you know, for, to uh, lesson and unit design. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just add, I mean, I think when you think about, because I mean, we're kind of talking about broader measures of student success, is sort of, I mean, sure. and sort of, I think, it, you know, as, as we talk about it, I mean, we need to be thinking about, um, I mean, ultimately about long-term student success. I mean, you know, getting yep. them, you know, to and through you know, post-secondary and beyond. And so, like, you know, these things, I mean, these things matter. I mean, intuitively they matter based on our personal experience. Longer term, we need to demonstrate that they make a difference in terms of long-term student performance. And that's some sense that's sort of the, you know, the first round of sort of the, you know, the, the, the kips of the world, recognizing that a no excuses model was getting kids in, but not getting kids through right. to the level they would like. And so realizing we've got to go back and think about sort of an expanded model. So, I mean, we just, we just don't, have, what we're grappling with is having the evidence base. Is that, in, and I, I was very much, uh, you know, in the center of the RAND personalized learning study that we released last fall, and it's like the results are promising, but they're early, and it's really just a snapshot based on two or three years. Um, it's going to be some time before we have sense, some sense of, like, how these things matter to long-term student success. And I think to several of your points, the fact that you can't just be doing one grade or two grades, you're really talking about a sustained period of time mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with that uh, over many grades or mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Uh, just to kind of add to that point, though, we've been talking a lot about assessment and students and what we need to do there. How about on the teacher side? I mean, you, you, if you're talking about a systemic change that has to happen inside the classroom or inside the school, school-wide, uh, it really has to dramatically change uh, how teaching and learning is being done. What are some one or two things that you see as being critical uh, as a different role or a different qualification, different mindset among the teachers that are truly practicing personalized learning in the way that you know, we're painting the future? Uh, what, what has to change? Who wants to go first? So, you know, we, we have a little bit of a unique implementation model, of course, but uh, one thing that has to change is they have to be very uh, um, comfortable in a, in, a, in a very different type of model. So there's a lot of training up front, obviously. The role of the teacher becomes, you know, less about uh, pushing instruction, certainly, w which certainly we do some of. We've got, you know, synchronous learning sessions uh, all the time. But it's also about uh, being good data managers, understanding where to pull data on kind of student performance and how to group kids accordingly and intervene as necessary. So it's uh, the role of the teacher becomes a, a, about monitoring. It becomes about motivating. It comes about instructing, and it becomes about intervening when necessary. And and really using uh, data, which we try to provide in a helpful way to identify how to do that best. So you're really talking about an active participant in this. 
It's just a different type, different emphasis. I won't say that mm -hmm. teachers aren't it, doing this now, but it's a little bit of a different emphasis. So if it's you know if it's hundred percent teacher, it's a move from you know to say sixty percent teacher, but also you know mentor, facilitator, data Got manager, it. kind of all wrapped in one. Does anybody have a different point of view? Like you see the world differently for what the teacher has to do? It probably adds on to this a little <coughs> bit. Um, uh, wow, that's really small. Now. <laughs> I think we, we, we lost the lights over here. I think oh, yeah, that's yeah. what happened. Um, um, I feel like I'm being interrogated right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not that I don't well, you are. Know. You are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just call it moderation. <laughs> right? We just go, we call it moderated. But you're really, it's an interrogation. Um, so, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about this idea of, uh, you know, not the state, the sage on the stage, but the guide on the side, um, yeah. uh, which I think is very consistent with Stu just said. I, I think, you know, broadly speaking, uh, you know, if we use another sector as an analogy, if, if doctors had the same set of responsibilities that teachers have, we would see doctors do the job of the nurse, do the job of the, you know, x-ray technician, of the x-ray machine itself, of the drugs, of the, except, right? Like, we've put everything on teachers. And so uh, I guess the other perspective I would say is there is some just breaking up the role to have different jobs being done by different people, different technologies, et cetera. So you can have, a, you can have specialization. Um, and one of those roles is the student, right? And that, mm. that's where I think the power of personalization really comes is that like in that, those classrooms that I said the teacher is the hardest working person in the room, um, there's a clue there uh, about how to distribute the work. Um, and uh, and you know, I think parents and family members as well. Um, and as we think about school, the walls of the school merging with the community, as you've done with, um, uh, you know, the, actually the community itself participating yeah. in some way. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think we just have to think about all of the roles and how they this, get started. So you're really thinking about different roles and disaggregating that, those roles and having, is that what you're doing? Well, I, I'm going to give a little different perspective because what we've, what we've done with, with our staff, with our teachers, is um, we've actually got an instructional framework that's got our, what, what are essentially our instructional core values, our, you know, the, the things that we believe are important in the, in the um, design of lesson plans, et cetera, designing learning experiences for kids, right? So we've got eight dimensions that we, we talk about, and we've got a framework that that's, that's defines these things and talks about levels of complexity. So you know, personalized learning is one of the eight. And, and, and I think to some of the points made earlier, it's not a silver bullet, right? It, but it's got to be a part of the larger you know, instructional map. And so, you know, we, we talk about it. It's on our it's on our you know uh, framework. We train on it. You know, we, we, we tie it together with other dimensions. Are they evaluated of on it? And and we crosswalk our framework with uh, Charlotte Danielson's uh, evaluation tool, which our administrators use. Right. So we, we coach our principals in how to look for those instructional elements that you know, represent our core values. Personalized learning is one of them. So we, we coach our principals in how to see that when they're evaluating teachers. Can I ask you Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, I forgot what it's called, the business, like the kids that when they're like. Oh, Vantage. Right, yeah. Vantage, because the, the, you should talk about, because yeah. the, they're doing work for the team, right? And right. you've expanded, well, yeah. So, so yeah, we have, so we've got an innovation platform. He's interviewing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is, Aon came and visited us That's a while so cool. back. Yeah. And, and um, so we've got this innovation platform in, in our district. So we really have a structured, intentional way of growing ideas. We crowdsource our staff. You know, it's very, it's very, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, engaging for our teachers, et cetera. And but one of the ideas that came through this process was sort of to this, to this notion that, you know, we need to um, p put kids in, in a position where they can really experience what it's like to be out in the wor world of work, right? These kids are going to college, but what is it like to, you know, to work on a project at General Mills, which is one of our, you know, Fortune 100s. And, um, and so we, we, we tested this idea and it, and it tested well. We scaled it, and now we're in our third year. We've got 200 kids in this program, and it's fabulous. But these kids are working on real projects from General Mills, Target, right? And, uh, and what kids will do at some point in the, in the semester, they'll sit with their you know, 100 colleagues in class, and the teachers will talk about 10 different projects that they could work on. They choose which project they want to apply to, to be on that team, right? So they form project teams. So you can hear what's happening. There's a personalization of learning here. They get to look at these 10 projects, choose the one that they're interested in. They apply to be a part of the team where they'll collaborate right, with other students to deliver a, a, an outcome, solve a business problem. 
And you know, these are these are wastebasket projects that General Mills couldn't, you know, didn't have the, the staff to do, but they can give them to us and let us have fun with it. Well, a lot of our you know, Best Buy, for example, just came back to us and said they're using the student idea. They're, they're taking it to market. You know, it's like kids are getting real experiences. Now that's a, you know, that took a while to build that, but there's a lot of personalized learning baked into that, you know, that program. I think that's why you bring yeah. it up, Aaron. And a lot yeah. of work that the teacher didn't have to do because. This, you know, and it's, and it's a good example yeah. of a uh, really a, a good partnership work as opposed to you know just it's sending awesome. in a couple of volunteers or something like that. It seems, seems more authentic and. But to your point earlier, yeah. John, about you know what if this isn't what if this doesn't work for kids? Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, the kids that go to this program, we get we have parents that tell us, you know, I thought I'd lost my son or daughter. They they don't care about school anymore. You know, they step into this program and it's a 180 degree turn. You know, they're at the dinner table telling mom and dad what they did that day, it's completely different from, you know, yesterday. So it's, you know, I, I do think there is some secret sauce here around personalized learning. When, when we give kids those opportunities, they, it does change the, move the needle, I think. Okay. So, can I, can I, I just, yeah. I mean, I think one thing, again, we haven't talked, I mean, Eric touched on it, and we talk about personalization, particularly when we think about secondary, you're starting sure. to think about right. sort of college and career pathways right. and thinking about sort of exactly. like, you know, their, their, their post-secondary and workforce experience. And I mean, you know, that notion of finding something that they're really engaged with and like a career or uh, occupation in one form or another. I mean, so that particularly at the secondary level, thinking about how this connects to their personal interests and aspirations, I think is really important. Right. Yeah. Um, so you're defining success differently, obviously, for each student in that way as well. I don't know that you're defining success differently. It's just that it, it's, again, Different. I mean, different personalities have different aspirations. So it's 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 more about making sure that I think I guess if I a worry I have is we talk about this so generically about like when I first heard you say this at some level, you know, in elementary, elementary teachers have been differentiating forever. I mean, they've, there's been all sorts of structures sure. at the elementary level. There are fewer constraints. Sure. Many more at the high schools or the, the secondary level around master schedules. But it's going to look different at different levels. And I think particularly yeah. about connecting kids to a career that they are excited mm -hmm. about, I mean, it's just really important. Yeah. And again, you know, personalization plays out differently at different levels. That's great. So listen, we have about eight minutes. So how about I give each of you a minute or two, just some final words on, given that our title is uh, Delivering on the Promise of Personalized Learning, and from where you sit, I mean, each of you do something very different. So I don't expect <coughs> you to kind of have the same answer uh, or answer the same question. But from where you sit, what are one or two things that you could be that we could be doing as a sector differently or better uh, to uh, to realize on the delivering on delivering on the promise of personalized learning? Brad, do you want to start? You went last last time. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, I think that we're I mean we're thinking about a lot, a lot around quality. I mean, the, the fact is again, it's like we you know we funded a lot of research in this space. I can say that the the Rand study, it's like you know, promising evidence, but by no means definitive. Uh, and when it came to what characteristics mattered the most, um, there's not much we can say about that. And even earlier, talking about subject specialization, I mean, Ro Rocketship, for example, which has been a very successful, you know, elementary network, they do subject specialization at the elementary level, do we, you know, which is fairly unique. Do we know how much that matters or not? Um, we don't, not really. Um, and so I think that, you know, going forward, it's, um, we, we have this, this tension in that this is an emerging innovation that we've got to let evolve and grow and adapt over time. But at the same time, we've got to start getting more specific about, again, what models, what characteristics, what structures matter the most. And so I think, I mean, I think that's, you know, we're excited. We see a lot of enthusiasm. The early research is promising. Um, you know, this, you know, again, we've seen personalization in every facet of our life. Why not education? Um, but it's still early days as yet. And I think, I mean, the challenge for us all is to think about going forward is, you know, how do we codify these? How do we codify in a way that gets more specific about, you know, what matters the most, but at the same time, you know, provide the space to innovate? Stu? I think first we've got to make personalization easy, not harder. I mean, we talked mm -hmm. about a, a story about personalization, you know, creating more work for the teacher. but. Uh, you know, when we think about it in a virtual environment, it can be, it can mean, personalization can mean more work for the parent, more work for the student, more work for the teacher, and more work for the administrator. So uh, deploying new technology, de deploying new practices, uh, 
we have to be very mindful of uh, what we roll out, how we sequence it, how we train people accordingly. I think uh, Brad also just touched on the notion of relevance a little bit. We certainly, as we think about secondary and creating pathways to post-secondary, uh, that you know, career piece is really, really important. It's a way that we've seen kids uh, get ignited, certainly, and uh, very vested in their own uh, learning, which is, you know, obviously a form of personalization in and of itself. So uh, those, are, uh, those are certainly a couple things that we're thinking about. Okay. Elon? Sure. Uh, so I think that we have to consider the work of developing new models <coughs> of school, ones that are personalized, as a serious R&D effort in a way that our sector does not <laughs> acknowledge, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, Elon Musk, before he built one car, had a billion dollars <laughs> to build that car. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we don't get a billion dollars to reinvent <laughs> education. Um, and, and I think that's a problem. Uh, I, you know, when, when you think about the amount of R&D development, iteration, validating learning work um, that it takes to build models that are going to be, you know, whole school codified products that people can adopt and adapt into their environments, it's going to take real work. Um, and absent that, what I fear is that, as I said earlier, we're going to digitize the old model. Right now, every ed tech company given the choice between building the thing, the, a product that's going to be useful for the future or digitizing the current one so that more schools can buy it today, by and large are making a second decision, um, which makes sense because that's what their investors are telling them to do. Um, <laughs> and, and it's actually not going to move us forward. And so I guess I'll sort of end with my biggest fear, which is that for all of the talk and effort that we put into, and money that we put into personalization, we're actually going to just end up painting the dinosaur a new color <laughs> rather than, you know, truly doing something different. Uh, because remember, 1985, it was all supposed to change with the Apple IIe, I think it was, right? Uh, and so, uh, so you know, the, the, the thing I'm meditating on a lot is what does it look like to bring real R&D capacity to school design? Okay. Eric, and maybe, you know, from your point of view, there's you, what you're going to be, maybe what you would say to other educators or people who are running systems, mm -hmm. but you, what you could also be saying to folks that are represented by a lot of the attendees here, people who are trying to provide these tools and systems and products. Well, you know, just, um, just before we started here, we were talking about uh, the uh, announcement from Mark Zuckerberg about his investment in personalized learning. And, and I mean, that, that, that can only help. I mean, that can only, you know, bring better products to the market faster and you know there's going to be a lot of failure in, in that journey right but um but it's going to serve kids because there's an there's an investment that's going to that's going to trigger some great thinking so you know i'm optimistic about that um you know i, I love what gates does by you know by finding a good uh, schools and districts to to you know put forward as models i mean that's that's a really valuable contribution so you know i um I want those things to keep happening. You know, from my perspective at, at district level, it's it's a little less uh, um, sexy. I mean, we're 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 just doing the we're slugging it out with our instructional framework. We're we're training teachers. You know, we have so few minutes. I mean, I don't know if people realize how few minutes we have with teachers to train, and and it's it's terrible, but it's the reality. So we have to use those minutes. You know, in a, in a very precious way. So that's the kind of work we're doing. You know, we're trying to figure out those those. Those opportunities, we've got to really um, grow our teachers' ability to, you know, to design lessons that, that, that represent this thinking. Okay, and so it's not, it's not glamorous, but what we try to do in our district is really go for, you know, alignment. All the arrows point in the same direction. We want our teachers to know these are our core values, our instructional core values. They, they bump into it all the time, and they see congruence in all of our programming, right? So. We don't want teachers to feel like they're under assault from their own district, right, with every new initiative. So we, we try to make sure things align. We, we, we try to you know, respect the busy lives of teachers, and, and it's hard. But, it's, but that's, you know, I think from, from a district perspective, it's really about that slow walk, you know, of, of really just being consistent, training people with, you know, integrity, and, and you know, one day at a time. Maybe I'll just wrap up by saying what I heard from all of you today is that personalized learning 
is a promise worth pursuing. Uh, that regardless of where you were on that scale of 1 to 10, uh, that this is an important uh, effort that needs a far and wide ranging, uh, I think, effort across not only at the district and the educator side, but as well as you know, research, philanthropy, funders, uh, companies uh, doing that work. The, uh, I did note the notion of working together a little bit more closely in terms of what the districts are trying to accomplish and what the vendors or product people or uh, you know, even philanthropists and um, researchers are trying to do and trying to pull that together so that with the limited amount of resources that we have, that we can be more effective uh, and streamline in that. Uh, I also heard that, you know, focus on quality. I mean, I think that goes for, that's probably true for any sector and any industry, but particularly true here, given the fact that we have limited amount of time. We're talking about something very valuable and important. Uh, and I think, Stu, you kind of echoed what Eric said, which is to say, hey, given the limited amount of time that we have to work with millions of teachers that are trying to do this in a very different way, whether it's elementary or secondary or in different kinds of contexts, that it has to be easy. We can't make this hard mm -hmm. uh, for them. There seems to still be a little bit of a debate in terms of whether this has to be a transformative thing at the organizational level. Can it just happen at the classroom level? Regardless of where that is, I think everybody agreed uh, that there has to be pretty significant change. It can't just be a bolt-on digitizing something right. that exists. Uh, so I want to just thank um, the four of you for engaging in this very interesting and fun conversation. You guys have been a terrific audience. Please join me in uh, giving them a round of applause. Thanks, John. Thank you.